Okay, good morning everybody. Um, I'm going to talk today about Michael Haneke's Caché, and I'm going to assume that you've all seen the film already, so um, for what it's worth, spoilers ahead. And hopefully I can do this without preempting the discussions that it's likely to provoke for you uh, in seminars. Um, but I'll do my best to help you fit it into the broader context of the director's other work. Um, but also the themes that he's developed for this film and how he's done that through the form and style of the film rather than through um, the specific aspects of its content. So it seems like um, a reasonable place to begin is the opening shot of the film. The opening shot is on screen for almost exactly three minutes. Um, the only thing that you get to interrupt it are the, the opening titles, which are, are overlaid. And you might think of this initially as an establishing shot. Um, that's the term we use for a shot, which sets the scene for you, lets you know this is where the action is going to take place. Um, and it's usually from a distant view, and then subsequent shots will take you closer to the people and activities that are going to occupy the rest of the film. But as the camera holds on this image, even after the opening titles, it exhausts that function as scene setting and becomes something else. Uh, you might initially have mistaken it for a still image. Um, you might not have noticed the film's star, Juliette Binoche, leaving the house. Um, you almost certainly didn't predict that what you might really be seeing is the point of view of Georges and Anne watching the video that has been sent to them in the post. So what you think is your kind of window on the scene is actually somebody else's point of view as they watch this tape. Um, so we might think of this as a point of view shot, but the question that the film immediately sets up is whose point of view it is. Um, and just to prove that there is nothing you can't use Jurassic Park to illustrate, um, here we have a, a series of shots uh, of people looking. The usual um, expectation is that you get um, a shot coupled with a reverse shot. Um, and at the beginning of Cache, you never get the reverse shot. You never get uh, a shot to show who is looking. It's constantly withheld from you throughout the film. So when we see a point of view shot in the cinema, or any shot that shows somebody looking at something, we are trained, um, and I use that word deliberately, we're trained to expect a reverse shot, a subsequent image that will show us who is looking, what they're looking at, or who is looking back at them. So a shot of somebody um, looking at something is almost invariably coupled with the shot of what they're looking at. This is a convention of film style um, that makes these kinds of shots work together. Um, and it, I guess it denies, uh, in cachet, it denies the viewer that ingrained um, payoff that is uh, a part of film language. Oh, yeah? um, so even from the beginning, Haneker is already playing with routine behaviours that you might have as, as a spectator. So the Jurassic Park example shows you that um, this is another example of a delayed reverse shot where we see people looking at something and we have to wait for the payoff, but it is very much delivered to us. You know, Spielberg delivers on the promise that we're going to get to see uh, what it was that we paid for. So back to the opening shot, if at first you thought this was um, the film setting out its fictional location for you, you will have been wrong-footed by the revelation that the shot is a material piece yeah. of that fictional world, a shot taken not by Hanukkah, but by a character in the story. And as Guy Austin puts it on the quotation you can see there, um, he creates a disorienting crossover between reading the images before us as subjective or objective. He even twists the knife on his viewers because we do get a kind of reverse shot that isn't part of the video, but it's not from the angle we want. We can see that we're, um, we're looking at the same street, but it's not revealing to us what we want to see, which is that reverse angle looking back up the street so we can inspect for ourselves where we think that camera may have been placed. So we see George come out of the house to try and figure out where the shot was taken. Um, he can't tell, and we're not given um, the clue that he's looking for himself. So this single moment sets out the entire mystery of the film, which will apparently hinge upon the secret of who is looking, 
who is filming, and also what the viewer of the tape is expected to do as a result. But um, Cachet is not a uh, whodunit, the director is, is keen to stress. Um, and if you're focusing on the question of who did it, you're asking the wrong question, he would argue, but because he likes playing games with you. Um, as with this sidestepping of expectations in the opening shot, he wants to make you self-conscious about how you are looking, to sensitise you to um, elements of the frame that you might not usually look at. And you can sense that as that shot holds, it creates um, uh, not an ease within the shot. Oh, it's a comfortable image and it's not changing. Um, it actually is designed to create a sense of, of paranoia or surveillance. So you might think that the driver of this film is that mystery about who's been sending the tapes. And it's perfectly understandable why you might crave that solution. Um, we like to think of the camera as something that reveals, that makes things clearer, tells us <coughs> truths, and shows us things the way they were at the point of filming, that there is an inherent objectivity to the camera. So if we had to summarise the overarching project of Hanukkah's feature films, we might say that it has been to disturb those comforts that we might want to take in trusting the image as a guarantor of truth, and also the comfort that we find in knowing that all mysteries will be resolved for us, preferably with a, uh, a happy ending. Um, he's adapted French director Jean-Luc Godard's oft-cited, but actually quite quite glib and uncharacteristic claim that film is truth 24 times a second. Hanukkah reworks that to say that film is a lie at 24 frames a second in the service of truth, or a lie with the possibility of being in the service of truth. Film is an artificial construct. It pretends to reconstruct reality, but it doesn't do that. It's a manipulative form. It's a lie that can reveal the truth. But if a film isn't a work of art, it's just complicit with the process of manipulation. So I draw attention to that last bit. If a film isn't a work of art, it's just complicit with the process of manipulation. He's constantly setting his work up in contrast to this monolithic Hollywood mainstream cinema that he, that he sees. And it's quite a, a problematic claim that he's making there, that there is this kind of simplistic cinema that mainstream audiences are just passively accepting and that his work... Uh, works against that. In another interview, he states again his suspicion of mainstream media. We take reality in the media for reality, which naturally is not reality, but only images of a reality. When we take the news that comes on TV as reality, it creates a state of derealization. It has nothing to do with reality. It's completely manipulated and it's false. We're actually deprived of reality. That's the theme of all my movies, and that's the danger. Key word there, I think, is reality, which he wants you to remember. So as you consider how the, this director goes about enforcing this agenda in his films, you might want to question his claims. Is he right to argue that visual media are almost always deceptive, misleading, incomplete, or dangerous? And I don't think he's necessarily talking about the content that they're faking things for us on the news, but more about how the form is manipulated to push us into a certain interpretation. Do his films help us to look differently at what is being shown to us? And if so, how do they represent a programme of re-education for spectators? Um, is this patronising to you as viewers to presume that you've had your critical faculties dulled by years of watching films, TV shows, news and documentaries that have duped you into passive acceptance of their version of events. Okay, how does he set out this thesis of the media's duplicity? Well, he does it not through a, a really essayistic form, but he does it through narrative frameworks that dramatise for us crises of truth, of memory, and in some cases, class relations. So these are, to an, ex to an extent, essay films, but they're built around quite traditional thriller plots. According to Lawrence Chua, Hanukkah's narratives point toward a consumer-driven culture with a naive understanding of violence, a lack of respect for its dangerous, transformative <coughs> power. In a society where basic relationships between people are mediated by images, reality has lost its realness. 
Hanukkah reminds us of this by pulling us into the trick of the spectacle and then exposing the trick itself. He reveals not only how it has seduced us, but in what ways we've been complicit in the seduction. In sharpening our responses to the world around us, he gives us a piece of truth, even as he deprives us of peace of mind. So that opening shot might might just be nothing. It doesn't point us in the direction of any particular details that might become significant, but by holding the shot longer than expected, Hanukkah plays upon what you might have been conditioned to expect, a cut to something that makes sense of what it is that you're seeing. So he's trying to resensitize you to the act of looking. Now, perhaps that sensitivity that he wants you to have is productive, making us more attentive to important details, or maybe, as I said, it just makes you paranoid. Is there anything significant in the name of the street, Rue des Iris? Is it just a nice name about flowers, or is it a reference to the eye? As um, Ara Osterweil says, extended vision promises knowledge, but knowledge, as Hanukkah will soon demonstrate, may be inextricable from individual and collective culpability. And here's where we bring in the other theme of the film, that of national, perhaps specifically post-colonial guilt, and the subject of historical memory. <clears throat> Moving on to what he wants you to, uh, to, uh, to understand from this film, there is uh, this underlying subtext of specifically French guilt about um, the Algerian war, but he doesn't want this to be locally specific. He wants this to be universal, that everybody has a kind of historical guilt uh, that is designed to be collective. So he doesn't want this to be specifically about events. The French um, colonization of Algeria has been, I'm going to use a slight understatement here, uh, a topic of controversy in France. But it's often been marked by silence and suppression which is how Hanukkah is characterizing the French relationship with its, with its history. Algeria is the, the second largest country on the African continent, and it was under French rule from 1830 until July 1962. And it, you don't need me to trace the entire history, but we might date back to um, the French imposing a blockade on the port of Algiers, and this was during a dispute over a perceived slight to the French consul to Algeria in 1827. He'd been slapped with a fly swatter. I like that image. Um, but this uh, unfortunately precipitates a full-scale uh, invasion of the country in 1830 on that pretext of being um, about disrespect. And the French spent the rest of the 19th century gradually conquering the country, tens of thousands of uh, French and other Europeans emigrated to Algeria, while demographic data shows that the indigenous population was reduced by about 30% owing to disease and violence over the next four decades. Um, by the end of the 19th century, European immigrants to Algeria are granted full French citizenship. And these settlers take over the most affluent ports and apply modern farming techniques to the land that they cultivate. Uh, the central desert regions of the country are not generally considered to have been part of France. So this amounts to um, your regular tale of plundering of resources through the confiscation of communal land and the administration of Algeria as part of the French nation. While many Jewish Algerians were granted French citizenship, most Muslims were not, leaving them disenfranchised with no voting rights in the country which purported to govern them. A law of 1865 offered Algerian Arabs applications for French citizenship on the proviso that they renounce Islam. The conditions of inequality for the multiple ethnicities living in Algeria created resentments that led finally to a war for independence, which escalates in 1954 with the formation of the FLN, the National Liberation Front, which conducts a guerrilla war on the ideological foundations of nationalism, socialism, and Islam. That's a very um, uh, potted history of what it is that, um, that we're looking at. But I guess Hanukkah kind of um, uses one particular incident as your, your indicator of, of this entire 
history. The FLN's actions included the killing of pro-French Algerians or European settlers in Algeria, and it spilled over into assassinations and bombings, sometimes referred to as the Café Wars in France, which saw gangland murders, sometimes of civilians, during rivalries between the FLN and the Algerian national movement. What Haneke wants us to focus on, though, is France's inability to confront the legacy of colonialism that, uh, that, that led to these events, and this is what he confronts in, in Cachet. Um, this one incident occurs in, um, on the 17th of October 1961, and it concerns uh, the former Vichy official Maurice Papon, and he was then head of the Paris police force, and the police were sent in to smash a demonstration by the FLN, which was in response to the imposition of a curfew upon Algerians in Paris and the killing of at least five um, innocent Algerians while the police were, were cracking down on the Algerian community to try and smash the FLN. The police were promised protection if they took um, subversive measures uh, to remove protesters. And this results, as the film um, refers to, in the police herding a, a crowd into the River Seine where many drowned. We still don't even know how many people died. Estimates put the dead at more than 200. The French government has acknowledged the deaths of 40 people. It didn't acknowledge these deaths until 1998. Um, this was not even Papon's only massacre. He was still in charge in February 1962 when police cornered communist demonstrators who were in favour of Algerian independence in the Sharon metro station. Um, plates of iron were dropped down a stairwell onto their heads, killing nine people. Plus, in 1998, Papon was stripped of all his medals when it was finally proven in court that during the Nazi occupation, he'd been responsible for organising the deportation of more than 1,600 Jews during World War II on death trains to concentration camps. But, I repeat, not until 1998. So it seems that um, getting crimes against humanity, which these were eventually proven to be, uh, recorded by a, a court of law and recorded by the historical record, can be a struggle. There are obstacles of political influence in the way of, um, uh, of truth-finding. So this is, this is what um, Haneke is alluding to, the concealment of <coughs> the truth about events which should have been public knowledge, which the media should have given you direct access to and, um, and recorded the facts of. Now, to some, the FLN's violent methods might, seem, might be seen to justify any necessary means of suppression, including the torture of dissidents and terror, terrorist suspects, as was later widely reported in the French army. And history bears the marks of these ambiguities, these clashes of opposing perspectives. So Haneke doesn't want this issue to be easily settled for you. This is why he wants um, those ambiguities to be reflected in the form of the film and not to give you an easy way to answer his questions. It's, um, however, an interesting and revealing side note that months before the film's release, the French law on colonialism was passed, <coughs> one article of which asked that school teachers and textbooks should, and I quote, acknowledge and recognise in particular the positive role of the French presence abroad, especially in North Africa. To say this caused um, some debate, uh, again, would be an understatement. This was partially repealed a year later under accusations of historical revisionism, but not before it had um, seriously set back French-Algerian relations. Um, we might also refer to the Evian Accords, which decreed that French servicemen could not be tried for crimes committed in wartime. So these are attempts to regulate, even re-edit and re-script the way that history might be recorded um, and remembered. And Haneke wants to show that art, whether visual or, liter or literary, can play a role in raising awareness or preventing the hiding of crimes such as those of Papon. But if he wanted to bring this hidden history to prominence, why didn't he go the route of historical reenactment. The same year he was making Cachet, Rashid Boukhareb was making his war film Andigène, um, released outside France under the title Days of Glory. 
This told the story of four Algerian Arabs who enlist in the French army during World War II to fight the Nazi occupation of France. It follows many of the conventions, one might say cliches of the war movie genre, but deliberately replays them with French Algerians in the key roles, showing the prejudice they suffered even as they made that gesture to fight for the country they called their motherland. Look at the tagline on the US poster, the one on the right. So powerful, it changed the course of history. Well, the film's prominence forced uh, the French administration to change the way it paid war pensions to foreign troops, um, to bring them in line with those paid to French soldiers. <coughs> I might add that none of that money has actually ended up being paid, but they have made a commitment that someday they will pay it. So that's, that's how they get the tagline, changed the course of history. Wouldn't you want your films to change the course of history, to have an active role in the world and actually influence directly the way people respond to and perceive historical events? Couldn't Hanukkah have done this? Reveal the injustice of the Papon incident directly through reenactment, showing respect for history by faithfully reconstructing its events in all these details. But crimes are not solved within the running time of time of a movie. They're not safely contained and settled, allowing you to go home thinking everything's okay. Hanukkah might be telling us that cinema is rarely deployed for the depiction of reality. Um, and instead of taking a, a, a reactive step and trying to forge a realist aesthetic, as many artists have tried to do, he's gone the other way and set about undermining the certainties that might traditionally have been associated with representational art. And he does this often in his films which uh, are about uh, invasion, about the safety of bourgeois existence being threatened by contact with difference. Now he says he was inspired by a television documentary about the Papon massacre to incorporate it into his film and says he didn't want this to be a film about specifically um, French problems. In every country, he says, there are dark corners, dark stains where questions of collective guilt become important. So he's taking a personal, private problem, the invasion of a single domestic space, and mapping it onto um, a more national conflict between memory and responsibility. So it's designed to raise awareness about the Papon incident, even though it's not really about it or a dramatisation of it. And because the crimes of that day have not been fully accounted for or acknowledged, um, the case in the film is also not closed, and its psychological after-effects are still very powerful. So he's incorporating it into the narrative of an unsolved crime and inviting the viewer to inspect each shot in his film for clues and demonstrating that visual clues don't necessarily solve things for us, but instead create more mysteries. They transfer suspicion and transfer surveillance and indeterminacy onto every one of the subjects. But I don't think he's making um, generalisations about um, the contingency of history. He's pointing in particular towards post-colonial guilt as being a bourgeois problem. And time after time, his films show bourgeois life threatened by otherness that disturbs its private spaces. Um, <coughs> Carl Schmitt um, has this lovely summary of, of Hegel's definition of the bourgeois subject. He says, the bourgeois is an individual who does not want to leave the apolitical, riskless, private sphere. He rests in the possession of his private property, and under the justification of his possessive individualism, he acts as an individual against the totality. He is the man who finds his compensation for his political nullity in the fruits of freedom and enrichment, and above all, in the total security of its use. Consequently, he wants to be spared bravery and exempted from the danger of a violent death. You can see this in the way that the film dramatises its themes over this tale of home invasion, with Georges and Anne struggling to maintain the integrity of their home, even though their home has not been physically attacked. Instead, it's been assailed by images and surveillance. And this is backed up by Elizabeth Ezra and Jane Sillar's discussion of the film, where they say that Cachet forces us to think about what we allow inside and what we insist remains outside, the ways we psychologically, physically and legislatively 
construct and imagine the idea of home. What does it mean to construct a home as a place of safety, a refuge that shuts out the world, the past? What happens on an individual and political level when we invest in the paranoid fantasy of home as a fortress? And I'd invite you to analyse the mise-en-scene, that is the staging, the design of shots like this. This is Georges in his TV studio where he runs a, a TV show on literary criticism. criticism. <coughs> Notice the, um, the rows of books. Uh, we can't see their titles, they may not even be real books, they may just be set dressing. But notice the similarity between home and work, the windowless spaces in which he spends his time. Um, this is, again, not a realist aesthetic, but the sets have been designed quite realistically, but also there's an expressionistic <coughs> angle to this where they're conveying something about his character through this deployment of books as uh, a wall and a defence. We don't see windows in their, in their apartment. The only kind of gap in their armour is the television. And um, we are, I bet you, supposed to notice the irony in this shot where they're having a conversation and the TV in the dead centre of the frame is showing you news footage of violence in the Middle East, decontextualised and just you know, occupying that central space in the frame and yet being ignored. This is not subtle imagery. These are not subtle connections that he's asking you to draw. Uh, George's problem is often about how to distinguish between threats and environment. We can see that he treats his privacy as, as sovereign despite having a very high-profile media job and he's built his home environment around that kind of protection. The paradox of television in a shot like this is it, it seems like we use it to look out upon the world from a position of safety. The tapes that, that they receive seem designed to remind George of the responsibilities on both sides to respond, to interpret and analyse what we see. So this is all about um, George's requirement to analyse the tapes, follow the clues, even though he doesn't always make the leap to acknowledging his own complicity in them. It might also be notable that when, uh, when George hides after Majid's death, he goes to the cinema. Again, he's hiding um, with images. What does he go and see? Do we know what he goes and sees? Well, we, we don't know for certain, but we can see the posters offering him choices. He can go and see um, Ma Mère, or My Mother, in which Isabelle Huppert, another actress from a, a, an earlier um, Hanukkah film, um, how, how shall I put this? The, the film concludes with um, her acknowledging her son's sexual attraction to her by cutting open her womb and inviting him to re-enter. Um, <laughs> well, it actually finishes with him uh, m <laughs> m masturbating over her corpse, shall we say. Or he could have gone to see Two Brothers, if that was too much. Two Brothers, uh, a French film about uh, two tiger cubs. That's much safer, isn't it? Two tiger cubs. What's the story? What happens to these two tiger cubs? They're separated um, as children. They're put into different environments and they grow up to hate each other and finally meet for a, a battle to the death at the end. To, is there a parallel there with the story between Majid and George? Or he could go and see Bad Education, the, uh, the Pedro Almodovar film, which is at least in part about the sexual abuse of children. So, you know, really loaded choices there, which may have even more um, resonance for, uh, for George. He's constantly surrounded by images which are reminding him of his situation. <coughs> they live in a place that is protected by simulation, but once the tapes start to arrive, those simulations, we might see them as, uh, as fighting back. So the tapes are an intervention into that circuit that force uh, Georges to interpret and act upon what he sees. So we might see this as Hanukkah's own intervention in what he sees as our passive acceptance of the images that unfold on our TV and cinema screens. We've been led to attach certain formal properties of moving image media to truth. That opening shot, again, has a fixed framing. It's an unedited, long take. So we might be expected to um, you know, attach uh, an objective sense of veracity to this kind of image. We like to think that surveillance footage, which this undoubtedly resembles, is objective and does um, reveal 
truths to us by the very fact that it's come from a mechanical medium which makes no artistic intervention in what has been seen and therefore records objectively. This is, you, you may have heard of André Bazin's notion of filmic realism and how it is pr protected and preserved by the use of long takes, by fixed camera framing, which allows you control over the image. You can look wherever you want within the frame. It hasn't been carved up by editing for you. To, to kind of force you to look in a certain way or to interpret the, uh, the sequence in a certain way. We might also note how um, we're asked to look at the formal properties of video footage. The fact that the, that the videotapes are, are sent to them and, and we see their material quality, such as the, 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 the snow on the screen or the rewinding of the tape, it's supposed to look a little bit like home video, and yet it's been twisted for us into something far more threatening. OK, um, I'm going to skip ahead to talk about uh, a couple of other uh, Hanukkah films. I was going to have a, a little aside about how he might have been referencing the Al-Qaeda death videos, which he's alluded to as a kind of um, particularly modern phenomenon, that um, you know, the, the decapitation of, uh, of hostages was one thing, but the obscenity that the media responded to was the videoing of it, the reduction of death footage to the status of a lolcat. You know, they, they were very consciously designed so that once they're on the internet, they're degraded and reduced to the lowly status of, um, of just other images. But that may be a connection that, um, that you'd like to draw. How his, uh, his engagement with visual media sits um, alongside um, what we see as a, a kind of culture of ubiquitous imagery. There's something very old-fashioned about um, Hanukkah's um, version of media and the way he describes it as this passive thing. Uh, he doesn't really engage with new media or the internet in any um, detailed way. So how about his other films? He has been preoccupied with death and violence quite a lot. In Cachet, there's specifically a series of references to cut throats. I think there's a pun intended on the similarity between to cut, as in with a knife, and to cut, as in to edit. And I'm afraid that is a real chicken laying down its life for your movie viewing pleasure. And more than one critic has noted Hanukkah's tendency to kill animals in his movies. He's not a, he's not a vegan's filmmaker. So the, another question might be, why does, he, why does he do this? Why does he like to focus on on violence so much, especially that unsimulated violence which um, kind of breaks our, our comfort zone and our expectation that everything we see will be fabricated and nobody and nothing actually gets hurt. But I want you to note a tendency in my plot descriptions of some of his other films. In The Seventh Continent from 1989, he shows us the story um, apparently based loosely on, on truth of a middle-class family who commit mass suicide. Apart from some illu uh, illusions that, um, you know, they're a bit disillusioned with uh, uh, the state of modern life and its, um, its dehumanising effects, um, there's nothing particularly striking about the family and we're never given uh, a satisfactory explanation of why they all decide to kill themselves. In um, Benny's video, we see a young boy who engages with the world mostly by watching it on video. One particular video, um, which is of a pig being slaughtered. Um, he watches this repeatedly and in slow motion, and eventually he becomes a murderer and has no um, real sense that he's done anything wrong. The obvious insinuation being here that the media is what made him do it. It's a, it's a very simple and simplistic connection that is drawn. But um, more importantly, we have his parents protecting him from the authorities because they feel culpable for giving him all of this, um, uh, this video equipment in the first place. In Funny Games, a middle-class family um, is terrorised by a pair of young men for no apparent reason except for pleasure and perhaps subtextually class vengeance. In all of these films, as in um, Cachet, the names of the parents of the family are Georges and Anne, or Anna, for a minor variation. Clearly, he has his bourgeois archetypes down pat. And there is something continuous going across 
all of these films where he wants you to make those connections between that disjuncture between real life and uh, recorded life. I'm going to show you a clip from the 2007 remake of Funny Games. But first, I want you to notice these um, side-by-side -side comparisons between the 1997 version of the film and the 2007 American remake. When asked to remake the film, Haneke agreed on the insistence that he'd be allowed to shoot every single shot exactly the same. Lay any of the shots right next to each other and you'll find this level of repetition. And it really is extraordinary um, how carefully this has been composed, even though the films are made 10 years apart. <laughs> what? Why? Why does he want to do this? Well, his argument is that there was nothing wrong with the film, but it wasn't seen by American audiences. And American audiences were the ones he particularly wanted to see it. Because it's about um, passive acceptance of media violence and how it overspills into real life. Um, so it's designed to be a kind of horror film in which a house is invaded, but it's designed to be impossible to enjoy. And so it, it kind of is meant to make you feel uncomfortable. Um, and when uh, lots of people walked out of the film's screening at Cannes in 97, his statement to the press was, well, walking out of this film is the only rational response. And if you can walk out, if you can resist the desire to know what happens next, you don't need to see this film. It's designed for those people who just have to know whether they're going to die and whether we're going to get to see them die. Um, this sounds horribly sadistic, and um, indeed it is a very cruel film. So the clip I'm going to show you is uh, a scene where the invasion has started and our uh, torturers are threatening the family, but with a kind of mock politeness, and they're playing on the expectation that they're wanting an exp explanation for why it is that this is happening to them. So much stress for politeness sake. <clears throat> I mean, I was just trying to be friendly. Improve relations. I thought at least we could keep this whole thing Why civilized. Are you doing this? Tubby, why are we doing this? Go on, say it. I don't know. The captain would like to know why. Well? It's difficult to talk about it. Don't be shy. You know exactly how hard this is for me. Jesus, what a drum. His father divorced his mother when he was this big. Or another woman. That's not true. He's lying. My mother got a divorce because... Because she wanted her little teddy bear all to herself. Which is why he's gay and he's a criminal. Got it? You're an asshole. The truth is, he's white trash. He comes from a, a filthy, deprived family. Five siblings, all of them on drugs. His father is an alcoholic. His, his mother, well, you, you can imagine. The truth is, He's fucking her. It's sad, but it's true. Oh, come on. Calm down now, Tubby. Stop it. You're disgusting. Can't you at least watch your language in front of my son? Oh, I'm... I'm sorry. Yeah, of course. What would you like to hear? What would make you happy? None of what I said is true. You know that as well as I do. You think he's white trash? Come on, he's a spoiled little brat. He's jaded and disgusted by the emptiness of existence. It's hard. Really. <laughs> he like that. <laughs> Look, now he's smiling. <laughs> <laughs> Okay? Are you happy now, or you want another version? I'm hungry. 
hungry. Let's see what there is. The truth is, he's a drug addict. That's where he's going to right now. That's why he's so nervous. I'm also a drug addict. We rob rich families in their charming vacation homes to support our habit. Mm -hmm. oh, stop this bullshit. I get it. Isn't that enough? That's good. Hey, Tubby, he's got it. He gets it. <laughs> That's awesome, really. Really. Listen, Peter, come here. Listen, we're going to make a bet now, OK? Come on, hurry up. It's Sit dark. down. It's dark in here. Come on, don't fall asleep. OK, we bet. What time is it? 8.40. That in, let's say, 12 hours, all three of you are going to be <laughs> kaput. OK? What? You bet that you'll be alive tomorrow at 9 o'clock, and we bet that you'll be dead. OK? They don't want to bet. Well, it's not an option. There has to be a bet. I mean, what do you think? You think they stand a chance? You're on their side, aren't you? Who are you betting on, hmm? OK. And their refrain is, um, you know, the slogan that is used on the, uh, on the poster, which is, you must admit you brought this on yourself. So what have they done to deserve this, this kind of this kind of treatment. The film almost dares you to um, uh, kind of enjoy the performance of these archetypal villains who are instructable. They're kind of, they've come out of the world of, of, of media and the family are kind of acting in this very realist, this style that is incompatible with um, what they're being threatened with. Uh, you will notice that towards the end of that clip, the direct address to the camera which really is um, a, a kind of startling thing that you don't expect. It's an unwritten rule. You don't talk to the camera. And you certainly don't ask the spectator whether they want the main characters to die or not. This is uh, something which is very divisive amongst audiences as a kind of betrayal. There's a scene where um, one of the killers is, is, is finally shot and his companion just takes a remote control and rewinds the video to change events that we've just seen. This is cheating, this is, this is not fair, but Hanukkah wants you to be put in an awkward position as a spectator, and I would argue that this is his recurring project in so many of his films, to make you uneasy about your role as a spectator. OK, so um, notice that, that direct address. Notice how the attackers play games with propriety and, and manners, pretending that they're behaving properly with consideration and fairness, twisting all of the bourgeois values that the family had thought offered them safety. So I would suggest this is doing something very similar to what Cachet is doing, but in a less subtle and more openly cruel form. But before I uh, sum up, I want to bring in a, an objection to, uh, to Cachet. And this comes from Paul Gilroy, who berates the film partly because he doesn't accept that the film's omissions and the things that it doesn't tell you are designed to convey a, a sense of forgetting of France colon France's colonial past. Hanukkah might argue that the reason he doesn't tell you all the, all the truth and reveal all the mysteries of the film is because that's what life is like. We don't get the truth of historical events. Uh, Gilroy rejects the film's use of the Papon incident and suggests that he just shouldn't be reducing a historical event that deserves to be unearthed and remembered as uh, a narrative convenience. He's also fed up of characters like Georges being used as ciphers for exploring post-colonial subjectivity from a white bourgeois perspective. So I throw this discursive spanner in your works as you're, um, as you're discussing the film. Is this a, a, a very problematic film? 
And he says, when the magis of this world are allowed to develop into deeper, rounded characters endowed with all the psychological gravity and complexity that is taken for granted in ciphers like Georges, we will know that substantive progress has been made towards breaking the white bourgeois monopoly on dramatizing the stresses of lived experience in this modernity. So it's, um, you know, he's suggesting that we don't need more films about middle-class people whining about how difficult it is for them to remember history and to feel bad about it. Um, he, he wants more films which kind of centralize that post-colonial subjectivity. So I want to leave you with some questions because even though I've talked a lot about this film, I don't think we've come anywhere near to exhausting what it is that you can discuss. A more interesting question than who sent the tapes might be, why are we not told who has been sending the tapes? Hanukkah can't have forgotten. He can't have been unaware that in setting up a mystery, the usual etiquette of film is to eventually solve that mystery. It seems impolite not to give the audience what they might have thought they'd been promised. So why has he started but refused to finish the work of a generic thriller? Also, what is the responsibility of Georges as a child? What has he done wrong as a six-year-old boy? We surely can't be expecting six-year-olds to carry the burden of colonial guilt, to bear the blame of their parents. And notice how in so many of Hanukkah's films there is that kind of clash of interest between the young and, and uh, their adult guardians. Constantly comes back in his work. And we don't know although it's insinuated that the tapes are being sent by the sons of these two families. Um, Georges was able to get Majid expelled from the family by playing on deeply held suspicions that Algerians might be savage, dangerous, liable to explosive violence. So that may, may be a, a clue to the kind of guilt that um, people are expected to feel, Hanukkah argues, as a result of, of seeing this. Um, the film confronts Georges with the end products of his exploitation of prejudice, the ease with which he's consolidated his privileged position in family and society by expelling the colonial subject from the family and from social privilege. Note also the ambiguity about what is a dream and what is a memory. All of those apparent flashbacks to the events from their childhood have a, an ambiguity about them where we can't tell whether this is George's subjective memory or whether this is a kind of actual window for us into the past. So it could be that he's completely imagined that, that image of Majid coming at him with an axe. So I think that is the key to unlocking the film, is that question of whether an image is subjective or objective. Who is looking who is seeing? Whose memory is this? But I would also add that you can't work it out. The point is that there is no way to definitively assign a subjectivity to any of the shots in the film. And I have to leave you hanging on, on that note, I'm afraid. Thank you.